This is Runehammer. RPG Talks. Design theory, Q&A, and counter methods, story building, DM deep thinking, and game building. It's all right here. So strap in, and may your dice roll high. Greetings, programs. It's Hanker and Fernail back once again. Old Branch Gilhelm here with Runehammer. And we're getting into some RPG talks. This is episode four. And uh, I'm excited about this episode because epitode? This is an epitode. <laughs> it's like a really big toad. It's an epitode. I'm excited about this one because I am eyeballs deep in a dungeon design right now, and I am right at the center of this very discussion. So before we get into how to provide a deep and potent theme to your next dungeon, let's take a look in the mailbag. Mailbag day, mailbag day. Let's go see what's in the mail today. All right, so uh, rummage around in here. Let's see what we got. What do we got here? A lot of bunch of pile of papers here. They fall down out of that hole in the ceiling and uh, land in this bin here. Here we go. All right. First question is about, can you have more than one GM or dungeon master at your table? And if so, and that's what uh, is wanting to happen, how do you manage that? Well, that's an interesting question. And first of all, that's a great problem to have. If uh, in your group at your tabletop, you got two people that are really itching to be the dungeon master, boy, that, that can be a really good situation because you can give each other relief. Now, if you've got several players and maybe you both want a dungeon master, you want to collaborate on it, the most common way that I know to do that is to have uh, a sort of a judge or, or referee and then to have what I like to call Monster Mind. And Monster Mind is the second GM and his only or her only job is to control the key monsters. So they, they don't need to control like every goblin or every ghoul. But if you have, especially if you have a caster or a dragon or something big and awesome, a pit fiend or something, a complex enemy, it's great to have a person who's trying to play that enemy to the best of their ability. Now, I've got to put a word of warning on this. If you do go with monster mind... It is far, far deadlier than having your normal narrative uh, DM running the monster. When you have someone whose only job is to be devious and to use all the powers of a monster and stare at that character sheet that monster has, oh boy, do they get they get as deadly as a player. And so be ready for that as the, the narrative or referee DM, if that's your role. Monster mind is super deadly. The other way that I've seen it done is to alternate. And this is a way to provide sort of prep relief. So what you do is the two of you get down on a collaborative sort of set of story hooks. And then each week or each session, you alternate who runs the game. And the other one can either play maybe a sort of an NPC or just have ongoing characters that duck in and out of the group. The one sort of pitfall you want to avoid when it comes to doing the collaborative DM style is you got to watch out for running DM PCs. Now, you guys have probably heard of these, right? It's like a, an NPC who is run by a DM who's kind of cooler than a player. These are demoralizing. Uh, if you have NPCs that can do more and are more powerful and cooler parts of the story than your players, it is really demoralizing and frustrating to players. So don't do that. If you have your collaborating DM running an NPC, make them like the guy who has to carry the gear or the hireling who's, you know, most likely to die. He's more like a red shirt than he is Captain Kirk. And that way the players continue to be the so-called yellow shirts or the, the, the key staff. And that DM controlled NPC is more there to maybe do a double cross or maybe to reveal a plot hook or maybe to just sort of serve a preordained agenda or function that the collaborative DMs have agreed on. All right, uh, what do we got here? Next piece of mail looks like playing two characters. So a simple sort of duplicity question that came in this past week. Um, got a group with this, uh, this gentleman here who has a dungeon master and two players. So their whole group is three people. Now, I actually think that this can lead to some of the best gameplay at the tabletop. Now, it's a little less of a party when you gather. Like, it doesn't quite feel like let's all drink soda and eat chips all night. Um, 
it's a little more intimate than that. But as far as the gameplay goes, it can be really fun to have a smaller group. So in their group, it felt so small, just two player characters didn't seem very exciting. So they're each going to try to play two characters for a total of four characters in the group, right? And he's asking me, you know, is this okay? Is it going to get difficult? Is it weird? Is it, you know, how, what's the best way to do it? Well, my uh, angle on playing two characters, uh, it's because you're in such a small group, is it's really actually quite simple. And it's definitely a good idea. You want a, a nice, full-feeling adventure party, especially for the sake, unfortunately, of casualties. If you only have two people in your adventuring group, like, the odds of anyone dying are just very low unless it just is going to undo the story, right? You need a little bit of, of casualty and a little bit of attrition in a group to make danger feel real. So, yes, definitely run two characters. But here's how you do it. You have a main and you have a sidekick. The main does all the cool talking and has an accent. So, like, I am the main character, and I have deep motivations and an interesting accent from a nondescript European country. Okay. But your sidekick doesn't really say much. He can actually just speak in player voice and almost speak in like a meta tone, you know, like you can sit and talk about him in third person. You know, uh, Jose uh, jumps across the pit. Right. But then Fernando, who's the main character, he gets to say cool lines. He gets, you know, all this kind of flavor. Now, the thing you don't want to do is demote the sidekick on his power, on his mechanical capability, because you need that capability in your group. Your DM is counting on four capable characters. So make him story and personality nerfed, but not mechanically nerfed. And this will keep your table flowing. It'll keep you less sort of multiple personality confused, and it'll keep what's happening focused around those two main characters, and the two sidekicks can maybe rise and fall, can maybe one of them can get killed and it's not the end of the world. Um, or maybe it is. Maybe like the revenge over your sidekick becomes the the focus of your story. And they serve as a fun supporting character and keep them in that role. All right. Our third piece of mail this week for Mailbag Day is, this is an interesting one. Um, basically, the question was, okay, I have this set up, I have this floating pyramid, I have the city, and then there's intrigue, we get up there, and then there's this waterfall, and there's this dark magic thing, and then there's this spell pool, and they go over, and then they go up to this thing, and they go to, and then the final sort of uh, statement was, I have all this stuff, but what am I missing? And then I'm like, I'm reading the thread, and I'm like, uh, well, wait a minute, let me scroll up a second here. I look, and it's just this this wealth of goodies, like all these cool little treats and great moments, and they're interlocking with a cool and, and exciting story that's kind of open-ended, and not everything is over to ex explain. And I was just like, man, this looks great. You're, you're not missing anything. I think a lot of us as Dungeon Masters feel this sensation, right? You, you set up a few bullet points. You, you know that, you know, there's kind of this area over here and maybe this area. Maybe there's a branch right here, and then there's a big scary thing. And then there's a little bit of a reveal, right? And then you're kind of looking at your work and you're like, I don't know. This is just, where's the, where's the beating heart here? Where's the, the hot blood up pumping? This is a good time to take a breather. And uh, as Don Forge Cast says, <laughs> you know, maybe go take a walk for a second. The thing you're missing is players. Your prep should feel a little bit hollow, a little bit empty, a little bit unfinished. Matter of fact, the, the, the more finished it feels, the, the more oppressive it can be to players. If anything, you're just sort of mowing the lawn for the football players to come out and run around and go crazy. So as you stare at the empty football stadium, yeah, I mean, there's something missing. The teams, the players, the, the collisions, the, the ball flying, the people cheering. You're not doing those things during prep. Those things happen during play. So it's just a little bit of a, an affirmation. You guys know I'm all about like mantras and power words and coaching yourself into being smarter and better at what you're doing. And this is a good time to learn one of those mantra-like behaviors. If you've got a nice little set of prep, you're feeling pretty good about it, but you get this kind of flat moment or flat sensation where like your limbic system doesn't just light up. Good time to breathe. Take a little break, rely on your players to fill in that grout, and just move on. Another great quote that I like is Tim from Tabletop Terrors said, you can't have the same conversation twice. 
And so it's important not to overly simulate a conversation that you're going to have in the future with players, because then to you, it's going to feel like the second time. And you don't want that. You want that, that spontaneous in the moment sensation as your players discover the conversation, the same way that you would discover the conversation as you're doing your bullet points before a session, you're kind of going, Oh, whoa. And then I could, Ooh, and maybe bada bada. And then, Oh yeah, don't go too far. Because you, you want to feel that at the table. So the answer to that piece of mail, you're not missing anything, my friend. Just your players and sitting down at the table in a nice, you know, glass of Mountain Dew. That's right. Drink Mountain Dew out of a glass. Be a grown-ass man. Because <laughs> sometimes you just want to drink Mountain Dew out of a damn jar. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. So that's Mailbag. Thanks, everybody, for sending in your questions and stories and comments on Facebook, as well as straight to my email. Um, you can also throw comments up here on Patreon. All right, now let's get down to the guts. Let's get down to the red stuff inside Chucky's little rubber head. All right. We are talking about theming dungeons, how to give your dungeon a distinct, robust theme. Okay, so before we dive into the techniques and the how-tos and the inspirational statements, let's take a close look at the question on the table here. What is a well-themed dungeon and, and why should I care, right? What, what is this question? Why did it get voted on in the poll, which thanks everybody for sounding off. After a little while of playing D&D, you'll start to notice certain elements, which we some call, sometimes call tropes in our drinking game here, here at Runehammer. The reason we drink when we hear the word trope is because it reminds us of because it reminds us of elder days, right? It reminds us of the beginning when you could have a five foot square stone corridor that turns left up ahead in the darkness, and that was exciting. That was all you needed because you were either new to things or because you're getting back to basics or whatever, right? But that would be a good example of a of a dungeon that really doesn't have a theme. It's it's default. And I think for a lot of us, especially because you're here at Runehammer, your, your interest in Runehammer is to master the art of dungeon mastering, right? So the last thing probably that you get excited by is a dungeon that you're working on that doesn't really have a theme to it. So you find yourself saying, well, I, I need something here. I need juice. I need something to inspire me is what we, we generally say. Unfortunately, inspiration can be an exciting term, but it really doesn't give you any meat to chew on. It doesn't give you any, any fiber to hold things together. It just gives you sort of raw excitement. So if we want to talk about giving a dungeon a nice dope theme, what we want is material we can use. So you guys know my, my stance on things is that this art that we do, this hobby that we do is all about specificity. It's all about specific things that you can do or use. And the saturation that we're seeing in the hobby right now of generality is, to me, less helpful. So let's take a look at very specific ways and specific things and pieces of creative substance that you can use to give your next dungeon or the one you're working on right now a heavy-hitting, robust, scary, inspiring, poetic, spooky, deadly, mystical, eldritch theme. Okay, so I have nine items. Nine items to theme them all. Six to make them awesome and three not to do. <laughs> okay, I'm not Tolkien, but <laughs> I do have nine things. That part is real. All right. The first thing that I want you to do, that I invite you to do, is what I mentioned in Dungeon Building 101 last week, and then I'm going to keep reinforcing. Find your core power word. And you have to commit to that core power word. This is a single word that you're going to return to again and again. Now, it doesn't have to be the title of your dungeon, because we all know we love to have cool titles to our dungeons, right? But you need a single descriptive core power word that every time you draw a blank, you can look at that word, it's written in bold text with a goofy wiggly circle around it in your journal, and you can improvise or remember 
a tiny or large fact about the dungeon. You could make a room based on this core word. This core word is everything, and you really do have to invest in the core word. You can't take it lightly. You have to see it as far as it can possibly go. Now, today's RPG talk is directly tied into the next sort of crisscross event that I'm working on right now. So on YouTube, you're going to be seeing Dungeon Building 101 Part 2. And then here on Patreon, we've got this RPG talk, and we've got a short story coming up that matches the video on YouTube. So all three things interlock. I'm having a lot of fun interlocking these different elements and thinking deeper, but I'm still circling around this one core power word. And in this one, I I tried to find a little more of a challenging one. My core power word for this specific dungeon build that I'm doing is tunnel. I want to build a tunnel dungeon. Now, you're saying, wait, don't all dungeons just have a bunch of tunnels? No, not at all. Totally not. And remember, we go all the way in on our core power word. So when I think of a tunnel, it's time to instantly say, what does that mean? Not just, well, that could be a corridor. No, a tunnel and a corridor are not the same thing. A tunnel is all kinds of specific things. It's, it's cut out usually to have a, a rail car go through it. It's usually cut under as a travel sort of mechanism. It's not like a maze, like a dungeon, right? It's usually straight or slightly curved. A tunnel... I I associate like maybe some water running and some cave-ins because tunnels are sort of hastily created to do transport. Transport is part of a tunnel. Um, A tunnel is often secret with a sort of a secret entrance and exit so that you can transport. Again, coming back to this kind of, it's it's a highway underground. A tunnel is straight for the most part. And that's, that's something that I can really take to the bank on this dungeon. It's a, it's a stinking straight line, guys. (laughs) When was the last time you made a dungeon that was literally just a massive straight line, like two miles, straight line? That's a tunnel. So you see what I'm doing is I don't really know how all these answers are going to play out. But once I have my power word, I I start to see them. The answers start coming and just let them come. Apply the Osborne method. Suspend the judgment of your responses to your power word until later. Maybe you'll need to cut them down because you'll have too many ideas. So that's my first tip, and you guys knew I was going to say it, for theming your dungeons, is pick your core power word. And for bonus points, maybe that core power word matches what's coming next in your campaign. Maybe your characters have gone up to the volcano, and so you know that your power word is going to be magma. Or your power word is going to be lava, you know, or your power word is going to be tremor, or or something to to that effect. You know that your character is in the swamp, so your, your power word is going to be mud. <laughs> or swamp. Swamp is a little bit of a general one, but hell, if you lean in on it, you get all these dividends, but you have to make it one word. Okay, so you're building your dungeon and you've got your power word, right? You've got it written down. We're doing this like a worksheet right now. So everybody in class has gotten their power word written down. Okay, next, you're going to write a little bullet that says the whole truth. Now, this is a bit more nuanced and a bit more complex, but you're going to need at least one sort of fact about your dungeon. You need a fact that basically explains why it is there, what it is and why it's there. The whole truth. And often the players will not get access to this. They may investigate their way around to it, but they will often not get the whole thing exposed to them. Okay, so the specifics of the whole truth for the dungeon that I'm building, this tunnel, is that this tunnel was used in secret in elder days to get forces from the tower in the center of town out to the edge of town so that they could come up behind any sieging forces and attack them from the rear. That's why this tunnel was made. But in recent years, there's been some collapses and there have been some monsters that have started to occupy the tunnel and people don't really go down there anymore. That's it. That's the whole truth. You do not need any more. Remember, brevity is king because it lets you remember things. So if you're writing the whole truth and it's a paragraph, you're never going to remember the paragraph. 
unless you're smarter than I am, which is probably almost everyone listening to this podcast. <laughs> I can keep a sentence in my brain. I cannot keep a paragraph in my brain and you want it in your brain. So your first bullet Core word, power word, right? Then right underneath it, the whole truth. Why is this here? Well, the dragons in ancient times needed a structure they could defend so that they could hatch their eggs in secrecy. There you go. Or, you know, the cults of Garrett Frack actually built this big mud palace where they could all grow Sahagwin demons in this weird gelatinous goo. Okay, done. Even that got a little long. <laughs> okay, the whole truth is an extension of your power word, but it's basically going to give you this kind of who, what, why, where, when kind of stuff. So as players are investigating and you don't have all the answers written down, I hope you don't because that sounds impossible. Players have so many wildly varying questions. The whole truth is going to give you this sort of root or center of knowledge that's going to let you answer questions in an improvised way that will always be consistent. So let's take my example. We have this tunnel that was hewn long ago as a way to break sieges. So we know that the entrance and exit are need to be secret. Otherwise, sieging forces would be able to use it to attack, right? I also know that it was probably hastily built. There's, there's something interesting there. I also know that military stuff is probably present, especially near the entrance and exit. There may be our weapon racks or other military supplies. I also can sort of situate this tunnel in my world in a way that it will serve this function. And so I can kind of know if, if this is, you know, salient to the adventure, I'll kind of know where it's going to be. And finally, I know where my tunnel is going to end. It's going to end at the central tower of this town because that was its function was the forces hold up in the tower during a siege could empty out and get out into the countryside. So I, I know a lot of the ins and outs of my tunnel. And then I know this other little piece. Lately, it's fallen into disrepair. And I can improvise into that, both in the design as well as answering questions from players. Okay, our next item, the third item. You have your core word. You have the whole truth. Now I want you to write down tie-in. There is one tie-in in this dungeon. What's a tie-in? Now, a tie-in is something that links the players to this place little detail, a little fact that they find or stumble upon that, that ties them to this place. The way to ask this question is, what do my players have to do with this dungeon? Not why are they here? What do they have to do with it? What history do they share with it? And find a way. The first response is going to be, oh, well, they just came to this dungeon because they heard there were treasure here and they're just plundering it, right? Right. Okay, great. But now they're going to find this connection. They're going to find a skeleton in one of the hallways. And around this skeleton's neck is a locket. And it's one of the player's sister. She was here. And she was killed by an acid trap. There you go. That's a tie-in. They're going to be exploring a dungeon. And they find a tapestry that portrays them exploring the dungeon, looking at the tapestry of them exploring the dungeon. <laughs> Another one could be they find a symbol on the floor that matches a symbol that one of the characters has on an amulet. You see what I'm doing? I'm looking for a way to go, there's a connection here. Do I know what the connection is and what it fully means? Hell no, I don't have time for that. I'm a normal person. But I can write tie-in and there's going to be a little moment. Now, Eventually, you're probably going to want to explain it. But if your, char your characters are not hungry for that explanation, then you can let it go. It's still going to be cool in the moment. Maybe there's uh, ghosts and spirits in a dungeon. And one of them is the grandfather of one of the characters. You know, family is always such a great way to do a tie-in. History, childhood, um, accoutrement, you know, like... Your, your equipment is somehow related to the equipment that you discover. Symbolism or epigraphic symbols are shared between a tattoo and architecture. These are all great things that work over and over again. 
they make players feel like they their characters really are integrated into the world in surprising ways. And you don't even need to know the full explanation, but just find one little tie-in. It doesn't have to do with any of your mechanics. It doesn't really even have to do with your core word, but if it does, bonus points, right? Because you're always coming back to the core word. So in my case, my core word is tunnel. So let's see. I think that since I have this sort of time fracture going on in the Rangers of Numidia, they're going to stumble across Helm but he got stuck in the narrows of this tunnel because it gets very narrow. I, I, for some reason, I see narrow in my mind. And he got, with all his armor and his spears and everything, he got stuck and his, his skeleton is there. And he finds his own skeleton stuck in the tunnel. And it's been there for a long time. What the hell? Explain it later. But that's the tie-in. And then it makes those narrows even scarier. Okay, so that's my tie-in for my tunnel. That's item number three. Item number four is probably the one that popped in your mind when you guys were voting for how to theme a dungeon. So we've got our core word. We've got the whole truth. We've got a tie-in that makes the players feel a part of it. And now what we want to do is get into senses and substance. What are things made of? How does this place stimulate the senses? But remember, we're writing in a journal. So you don't get a lot of words here. So I would probably just write the word substance. And then I would basically say wet stone, broken stone, flowing water. That's probably actually it. <laughs> supplies. There you go. That's another keyword. I want there to be supplies in this tunnel because that was its function. Yeah, and I think I'm starting to see it. So senses and substance is basically the shortest list you can come up with to answer what things look, smell, sound, and feel like as players are moving through the space. Are there stalactites? Is it outdoor? Is it a sunny day? Is it a rainy night? Is it underground? Is it, you know, smooth pavement? Is it uh, stonework from ancient times? Giving one or two answers here can later let you give a bunch of answers. So you're start, probably starting to see a pattern here. We're looking for ways to write in our journal in ways that we don't have to write a million words down, but later we'll have a million words. So senses and substance is the most literal way to describe your dungeon. Now, that feels a little general, right? So how do you get specific with senses and substance? Well, Honestly, a clever dungeon master could just look right back to his whole truth and see the senses and substance right there. Well, there's for my tunnel, there's tool marks all over the walls. The, 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 the floor of the tunnel is tracked with iron boot-like scrapes, right? Where like hundreds of men in armor have run through this tunnel over and over. There are all these crates and barrels that used to or still have spears and uh, maybe there's some like an oil slick and so on and so forth throughout the tunnel. Maybe there's a like derelict railway that they use to move all their weapons and armor down the tunnel quickly or even to move men. So see how my whole truth is giving me senses and substance. And then what does it sound like down here? Well, it's like this long, narrow tunnel, right? So it's like you can see a little flickering light in the distance. There's sort of this scary feeling of, of oppressive darkness. There's a lot of echo. So sounds are very confusing, easy to sneak down a tunnel, but not if someone's there because there's nowhere to hide. It's a freaking tunnel. So you see, my, my senses come out of my whole truth, but more so, it's just as I work through this process, I'm getting more and more mentally in the tunnel <laughs> or in whatever your dungeon may be. Okay, now the next one is one of my absolute favorites. This is excuses for danger. I want you to take your core word and your whole truth and make up a bunch of excuses of why things are going to be difficult. Now, one thing that's fun in every dungeon is that things are a little bit oddly difficult, right? It's like you have to jump over a little gap, <laughs> right? And it's like, you know, a, a DC of 15, right? <laughs> and you need your, your plus five decks to make this jump, right? But if you were just out in the in a sunshiny day, you could easily jump this little gap. But... 
there's wet moss on the rocks, or the edges of the rocks are crumbling, or the ceiling is drooped with vines that you get tangled in, or there are weird tentacles, or black goo that's making your boots stick. Uh. Finding a way to make danger excuses that fit is a way that's going to bring all this sort of narrative flavor we've been doing and bring it down to the mechanical level. And what you can do is once you start finding more of these danger excuses, you can start escalating them. Okay, so let's take my tunnel, for example. The best danger excuse I can see in my tunnel is the narrowness of it and the straightness. There's nowhere to, you know, there's no open space to hide. And in spots, it gets so narrow that you can get stuck. And it's very difficult to draw weapons. It's very difficult to fight. It's very difficult to move. You're definitely going to be single file. And you all know how terrible being single file can be if you're fighting monsters. And if, let's say, I want them to jump. The ceiling is so low, it's really hard to make a jump. And in spots, the ceiling gets down like three feet high. And then you need to jump over a gap. Like, I don't even know. That's like, that's some American ninja stuff right there. So you see what I'm, I'm just taking my one idea and I'm finding all these dumb reasons that everything can be difficult. <laughs> Now, sometimes it's going to be really easy. Let's say your power word is magma. Well, geez, magma is definitely dangerous just in and of itself. But how can you play with it? Well, it's coming out of the walls. It's below the floor. The floor is giving way. The heat is oppressive in certain areas. So much so it's hard to even see. Oh, man, I got a difficult perception on a uh, uh, roll on my hands, right? Well, why, why did I fail that perception? Why is my perception DC 18? Well, all this heat and smoke is rising off this magma, and you, you can see like four feet. Danger excuses are going to bring it all down. They're going to let you turn your narrative concept into mechanical difficulty. Now, I don't even know if you really need to fully write all these down, but I think always writing two or three bullets below a little category is going to help you. So danger excuses, you could say, for magma, for example, you could say oppressive heat and you can say, you know, always under the floor and behind the wall. So anytime somebody crashes into a wall, they have a chance of revealing some magma and then everything's going to get more difficult because you can't be touching it. Or you can also use it as a, as a dungeon world partial success, right? Let's say you get, you jump a, uh, a gap, but you barely succeed. Well, you take one damage because one of your boots kind of dipped in a little bit of magma there. So you see, like, you only need a couple and then press them and press them and make it more and more difficult. So with magma, you can see where it's headed. You're going to wind up in a place where there's a couple little floating rocks and a big sea of magma. And the difficulty is through the roof because it's so hot. You can barely see. Your foot can get dipped in there. Your weapons might fall out of your hand and go into the magma. And so, you know, all these wonderful excuses for things being terribly dangerous. Okay, now the next one, you're not even going to write down. The next one is a method that you're going to apply. It's a mindset you're going to put yourself in. And it's a big part of being a dungeon master in general. And this is, you want simple big facts. And you want complex, nuanced, and detailed small facts. What the hell are you talking about, Hank and Fernell? <laughs> big facts are what we've already talked about. Your core word, your whole truth. Your, right? That's... Why, why is this here? What is this place? You've already got that figured out. Those are your simple, big facts. And you're going to keep them so simple that they're easy to remember. This was once a temple to a snake god. It's now sunken into the marsh. There you go. That's my simple, big fact. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Complex, nuanced, and detailed small facts. This is what it feels like when you reach out and touch the runes on the wall. If a player does that and wants to know what, what they're experiencing, this is where you need some goodies and you need them to be small, right? It's like soapstone, but it's been wet so long that it has this sort of layer of slime on the outside. But as your fingers slide down it, they reveal a dry, coarse sort of sandstone underneath. The glyphs that are hewn here in spots are oddly unaffected by corrosion. Perfectly square-edged, but in other places, the slow ooze has all but sort of rounded them away into nubs and into undiscernible blobs. 
The lever on the door is carved with a spiral motif. Like, there you go. That's a good one. I had to get in practice. Who cares what the level, lever on the door is shaped like, right? But the player gets this nuanced little moment inside their mind of their hand contacting this little spiral etched lever. It doesn't have to be some big clue that you're going to reveal something about spirals later. It's just a nuanced little small fact. What does the floor smell like if you go down on one knee and give it a sniff, right? (laughs) What happens if I poke a wall with a spear? What kind of support structures are holding this place together? Is it built on timbers or is it just sort of a leaning keystone system? Is it waddle and bob, waddle and bob, waddle and dob architecture? (laughs) Is it thatch? Is it a naturally occurring cavern? And then accessing these facts and giving them tiny little moments. The best one that I've provided so far is the door lever has a spiral motif. The keyhole, as you pick it, it's odds and square rather than oblong like most keyholes in towns and villages that you know of. It's a simple square. You've never seen a keyhole quite like this. The rope that's dangling above the pit is not woven in a spiral pattern like rope that you're familiar with, but a sort of an interlaced helix pattern that gives it a crisscross look and makes it easier to grip. Huh. Weird. So this culture that built this had more advanced rope making? (laughs) That's not going to have to do with something. That's not a clue. It's just something. It's just a nice little something. And on and on and on. So make simple big facts and nuanced tasty, detailed, small facts. Always make sure that your world goes all the way down to one square inch of data. What's in that one square inch? Is there an odd looking ladybug that's green and yellow that's crawling up the wall? There you go. That's not a hint of future events. That's not meaningful in any way. It's just odd and tiny. Okay, so there are our six things that you want to do. Now I've got three don'ts. First of all, don't worry about explaining, worry about describing. And this you feel the most with simple big facts and detailed small facts, right? Is like explaining to a character is, or player, is trying to give them all the cool, uh, basically, secrets. To try to give them all the info. Don't do that. Just describe specific things. There's a really good chance, and I would say it's 75%, that the players will never really plumb the the underlying facts of your dungeon. And that's okay. You want to describe. You want them to be the star. It's just a football field. They're the players. So don't worry about explaining everything to them. Just put your mind on describing things to them. And this leads us right into the second one. Don't answer questions they don't ask just because you know the answers are cool. (laughs) You can set up the sickest backstory to a dungeon. I mean, this whole thing about how the the, the queen fell from on grace and she was buried in this tomb and she plopped through the bottom of the tomb and then she actually met this beholder and they made friends and then they became this gelatinous mass and then they do and then all of it. And the players never find this out. Don't answer any any questions that aren't asked because you wrote the answers. If players don't really care or have the interest or the the impetus to find out how this goo got here, you don't need to provide those answers or find some excuse to reveal your prep. Don't do it. And this is yet another reason to keep your prep brief because it won't Put that like weird sense of overvaluing your prep and wanting to expose it to your players. Just answer the questions they ask. They're the focus. Okay, now my last one of what not to do is directly pursuant to my idea of a tunnel, but my tunnel is a bit of an extreme answer here. And that is don't hide in twists and turns. So a lot of people associate twists and turns with a dungeon, right? There's a lot of you know, different routes you can go and there's T intersections and it's like a hedge maze, right? (laughs) Well, anyone who has ever really done a big crawl that has those kinds of features knows it is very cumbersome and difficult without a dedicated mapper or really good detailed terrain on your table or something to really track twists and turns in a realistic 
and fun way. And this goes back to my old axiom, which is don't use arbitrary geometry in your architecture, right? Don't just have a bunch of twists and turns because twists and turns. That That is not a reason. That is not a use. Now, if this corridor was built in a zigzag shape because warriors hide behind each corner and fire arrows, that's different. That's a tactical structure. But don't put players through twists and turns in intersections unless those have purpose and excitement. And this is why I wanted to try a tunnel. The answer to this final question in my mind was like, can I make a dungeon that has no turns in it? It's just literally a freaking straight line. And that's when I had the epiphany to do Dungeon Building 101 Part 2, is how to build this tunnel dungeon. So don't hide your intention and your excitement in twists and turns. Just do as many as you need. One or two is usually plenty of intersections and turns. You just don't need a lot of them to get to the fun. A great example is Matt Click's uh, dungeon design sort of philosophy on Fistful of Dice, which he applied to our Oath of the Frozen King dungeon run that we did. A little ways back. And really, there was no navigation at all. We just went room to room. And it was fantastic. It was a great dungeon run. We didn't have to figure out how far to the corner and then go and like, oh, we have to go back. And which way were we going? Oh, yeah, we're supposed to go left this time. And we didn't do any of that stuff. We got right to the cool stuff. Do that. Get to the cool stuff. Okay, guys, that is my talk on how to heavily theme your dungeon. But as you can see, The real core of it is that power word at the beginning. If you believe in that and you can see the whole truth, everything else starts cascading out. And then it's just a matter of not overdoing your prep, not wanting to force your prep on players, just letting them be the star. And letting that core word take you all the way from the and letting that core word take you all the way from the big cosmic explanation, the historical explanation, all the way down to the bug crawling up on the spiral etched door handle. So that's my talk on theming your dungeon. This is RPG Talks episode four. I hope you guys had fun. I'm definitely having a great time delving. Hey, hey, see what I did there? Delving into dungeon creation ever since that great question that came up uh what two weeks ago i've never made a dungeon where do i start and i realized there's just so many different approaches that's the fun in it so getting specific staying brief that's always going to make all your work more fun and more fun to sort of discover revelations of your own at the table and uh you know see what's lurking behind the next iron banded door. Okay, guys, so keep an eye out for the short story titled um, The Tunnel of Hath Ordur. That will be coming up here on Patreon. And uh, depending on how quickly I can get her done, um, we're going to have Dungeon Building 101 Part 2 on YouTube. So it's it's been great having you guys. Thanks, everyone, for your support in September. That was fantastic month, really fun. And uh, we're going to have some horror stories this month coming up. Um, we've got more New Haven coming up. It's going to be a great month. So everybody stay tuned and I will see you out on the battlefield. Strength, honor, and beer. This here's Brandish Gilhelm. I'll catch you next time. 